Well, welcome back, everybody, to my crash course in formal logic. This is the last lesson of my first series, so congratulations for making it this far. I hope you guys had fun with the last lesson. That was definitely the hardest lesson I presented online. Now, in this lesson, we're going to study three things. The conditional proof, the indirect proof. These two are very closely related to one another, as we're going to find out. And lastly, proofs of logical truths. And if you master conditional and indirect proofs, you should be able to prove logical truths very easily. Let's begin with the conditional proof, a very common uh, type of technique used in a lot of logic textbooks. Now, earlier we saw two inconvenient, inconvenient truths. Truth tables can get very long, need, uh, hopelessly long, if too many simple sentences are involved. But if you try to go to indirect truth tables, that can be very confusing and complex if your conclusion is complex. They're not very efficient under those conditions. So here's how you do it the hard way. So, these can, proofs can become needlessly long and tedious. I mean, actually, the reasoning from 1, 2 to the conclusion is pretty simple. Really, what we need to think to ourselves is, man, wouldn't it have been convenient if, just for a minute, we'd had an A? We need a little horseshoe help here, and I'm going to show you, with conditional proof, how conditional proofs offer us the help with horseshoes that we really need. In plain talk, we would never have walked through a proof like that. It's just too complicated. We would just use common sense. And here's how we would have done it. We'd have taken the uh, proof, or rather the argument listed on the blackboard above, and we would have said, number one, suppose, importantly, hypothetically, that we had had an A. Then according to premise one, we'd get B dot C, and B dot C, line number three here says, Hence, we get B by simplification. And four, we just say, and if B is true, then B or D is true. And by that, B or D, line two would take us by modus ponens to E. So A does get us to E after all. Now what we're doing here in plain talk is a few steps. First off, we're saying hypothetically, assume that I did have an A. After that, uh, for conditional proof, we're just gonna say, what would follow? This is the scope of our assumption of A. Once we're done with A, we show that we finally did get to E under that assumption. So, we concluded, discharging the assumption, A would have gotten us to E after all. See how easy that is? But all is not lost. We can actually prove the, uh, the proof that was an argument that was on the blackboard earlier the easy way in our formal logical system. Our formal logic doesn't need to be devoid of common sense approaches to proofs. So rather than this longish proof that we just did a second ago, let's go ahead and shorten it up a little bit. Instead of doing th that, we're going to say, suppose hypothetically, notice I'm indenting a little bit, 
Suppose hypothetically we had A. I'm going to introduce a scope line to keep track of how long I'm using my assumption of A. Well, if A is true, then we're going to get uh, to B dot C through modus ponens on 1 and 3, and then we're going to simplify down to B. After that, we can wedge off to D. Once we have B wedge D, we can do modus ponens on 2 and get to E. And that shows that A would have gotten us all the way to E. Notice I unindent. I'm back out of the scope line. Here's how it worked. I introduced an assumption for conditional proof, then I did modus ponens using the assumption, line 3, and then I simplified, used addition, and did modus ponens one more time. Now, all of those justifications occur within the scope of the assumption of A. Finally, I got via 3 through 7, uh, via conditional proof, that A really did get us to E. Now remember, we're going to be indenting here when we ever use an assumption because E does not follow. Line 7 does not follow from lines 1 and 2. It followed from 1, 2, and 3, our assumption for conditional proof. And we need an indentation to note that. So basically, any conditional proof you ever have is going to have three steps. Basically, you're going to introduce your assump. I hope this is a good mnemonic device. Here's your assump or your assumption for conditional proof. After that, you're going to have to make some sort of jump to whatever it is you want in the consequent of your conditional. And once you make that jump along your scope line, well, then you've got to dump your assumption. So make the assump, make your, introduce your assump rather, make your jump, then dump. Dump your assumption for conditional proof. It's that easy every time. I guess we should put this in more technical terms because introduce the assump, get over the jump, and dump really just doesn't do it well, does it? The key point is you need to explicitly introduce your assumption for conditional proof. Once you've done that, like we did on line 3 of the last proof, keep track of how long you're using that assumption. How long you're using it is called the scope of the assumption. And then when you're done using the original assumption, discharge it when you're done with it, and mention that the result, the horseshoe claim that you finally reached, follows by conditional proof, or CP for short. So if you remember these three points, then you've pretty well mastered the idea of a, a conditional proof. It's a great horseshoe help. It get, lets you uh, reach horseshoes quickly and efficiently that, in ways that would otherwise be long and tedious. But still, no matter how uh, technically you uh, introduce uh, the idea of con uh, conditional proof or explain it, it's still going to come down to three basic things. You know how, need to know how to introduce your assumption, make your jump, and then discharge the assumption when you're done. Introduce your sump, make your jump, then dump. And then you're done. Now, there's two things that you're allowed to do with conditional proofs that we need to cover, and there's three things that you're not. These are going to seem kind of intuitive, so don't be uh, too intimidated by the fact that you need to memorize five rules. You, first uh, permission is you may use conditional proof more than once. Here's an example. So suppose that G implies H dot I and J implies K, and premise 3, G or J. Therefore, uh, can we reach this long conjunctive claim that you find for our conclusion? Now, to get this proof to work, I'm going to try to prove the second conditional of our conclusion. In other words, I'm going to try to get from tilde K all the way down to H. And of course, I'm going to have to fill in the blanks along this proof. Once I do that, I can discharge the proof, uh, assumption. Tilde K would imply H if I can get this whole proof inside the green scope line to work. After that, I'll just go ahead and try and prove the first conjunct of the conclusion, that tilde H implies K. I'll just introduce tilde H as a, a assumption for conditional proof, try to get to K, and if I can fill in those blanks, I'll have tilde H implies K. Notice, if I get line 10 and line 14, I pretty well have my conclusion. All I have to do is add the two together, right? Or rather, in that case, conjoin them. So, obviously, I can get to line 5 once under the scope of 4. I just need 2 and 4 modus tollens. After that, I can get to J or G. All I have to do is take premise number 3 and flip-flop around the wedge in premise 3. I'm only doing that because I want to do disjunctive syllogism to get to G, and from G, I want to get to H dot I. Why? Because after that, I can simplify down to H. So tilde K did get us to H. Now let's fill in the second scope line. Under the assumption of tilde H line 11, I can demonstrate that 
tilde tilde k. How did I do that? I just used the conditional that I'd just proven before, that tilde k does imply h. And a double negative amounts to a positive, so 13 follows from 12. So I did get all the way from tilde h to k, as line 14 indicates. All I have to do to get my conclusion, I can join the two things that I demonstrated from my conditional proofs. You can use more than one conditional proof in a proof of any particular argument. Well, now that I've given you a common, uh, very common sense permission, I'm going to give you one very common sense restriction on conditional proofs. That restriction is you may never use lines from a discharged conditional proof. For example, so let's take a look at the proof that we did just a moment ago. I'll shorten it up a little bit. Now suppose instead I tried to reach line 11, the line that says h, and I made my justification this. I'm going to use lines 4 and 10 and do modus ponens. Line number 4, though, shouldn't be able to be used. We discharge the assumption line, uh, number 4. Let's take a look at a case in which this logical maneuvering clearly commits a fallacious inference. Now, line number 1 of our proof, or premise 1, says P. Line 2, premise 2, says Q implies R. Does it follow that Q? Not at all. But what if we use this technique? We'll say tilde P is an assumption for conditional proof, and we'll use line number 1 to wedge off to Q. Having done that, we can use lines 3 and 4 to get to Q. Now, what does this prove? Tilde P does take us to Q under the assumptions just given. No problem with the argument thus far, but what if we try to say, therefore, Q? After all, doesn't Q follow from lines 3 and 6? Uh, well, here's the problem. What uh, was going on within the scope of the assumption should have stayed within the green scope line of the assumption. Number 3 should not have been able to be used after line 6 where the assumption was discharged. It's kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Except, of course, when what happens in Vegas stays in God's mind for all eternity. Well, in this case, what happened within the scope line of the assumption should have stayed there. What happens in the box, I tell students, stays in the box. Once you uh, discharge your assumption, you're out of the box, can't use what's in it anymore. Well, let's return to our topic of what's permitted and what's restricted when it comes to conditional proofs. Now, one thing you have permission to do is to use conditional proofs within the scope of other conditional proofs, and that can come in handy. Try this for example. Suppose we have a premise L implies that M implies N wedge O, and a second premise that says M implies tilde N. Does it follow that L horseshoes to tilde M wedge O? Take a look at the conclusion. There's obviously one horseshoe, but look inside the parentheses. Tilde M wedge O is another horseshoe claim. If you use implication, you can see that that means that M implies O. So let's just try to find, to prove that L implies the what's in the parentheses, and then we'll try to see if M really does imply O. So first I'll introduce L, and by modus ponens on one, that's going to get us a little bit of our distance. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to assume M. Why am I doing that? Because I want to get to the final uh, conclusion when I jettison this uh, conditional proof that M implies O. So here's what I'm going to do. Once I get to M implies O, by implication that is tilde M wedge O. See how that works? So fill in the blanks after five. Line number six is going to be N wedge O by modus ponens, and then tilde N by two and five modus ponens. Now once I get to that point, I can prove that O by disjunctive syllogism on six and seven. So M really does imply O as line nine says. Now at line nine, huh, that rhymes, notice I've just jettisoned one condition, just conditional proof. I've discharged a conditional proof, rather. Lines 5 through 8 have been discharged, but the conditional proof on 3 through 10 is still going strong. To uh, jettison that or discharge that conditional proof, we need to just say line 3 really did imply line 10. And that really is all of our conclusion. Now, along uh, the outside of any proof, there's always an imaginary final scope line, if you want to call it that. Well, basically what we've shown is that lines 1 and 2, kind of like assumptions, prove line 11. That scope line's always there, but kind of imaginary. Well, that mentioning of an imaginary scope line that's always there brings us back to our next issue about restrictions. Don't end a proof on an indented line. Always get back out to that original scope of the original premises.
So in the last proof, we had this sort of thing going on. Let me just illustrate the importance of this uh, particular rule. Suppose that instead of going back out to the scope of the original assumptions on our conclusion, which was conclusion line 11, suppose instead as a conclusion we tried to introduce O. Now 1 and 2 definitely do not prove O, but how, what if I tried to say this? I'll just end my proof on line 8, and therefore premises 1 and 2 really do prove O. Is this a problem? Let's take a look at a case in which this type of uh, logical thinking clearly leads to bad inferences. Lo uh, premise number one says P, and the conclusion is Q implies R. Now, this argument shouldn't work, but what if I said tilde Q by assumption for conditional proof, and there's no rule on what you can introduce as an assumption, and then I wedge that off to R by addition. Now, from there, by uh, line number three is equivalent to Q implying R by implication. Now does this argument, or proof rather, show that P really did imply that Q horseshoes to R? No. It shows that line number 1 and line number 2 lead to line number 4, but it does not show that the original argument we were analyzing is valid. So let's return to our two permissions, three restrictions talk and talk about the third restriction. You cannot discharge two assumptions at a time. You gotta go one assumption discharge at a time if you do it at all. Now going back to the argument that we just did, I'll erase this final scope line just so that you can see the argument more clearly, and notice, I put a new conclusion in, L horseshoes O. Now does that conclusion follow from 1 and 2? Take a good look at 1 and 2. By now you should be convinced it doesn't, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to shorten up our entire proof and say, I'll just end at line 8, and then I'll jump over to scope lines and say, look, line number 3 on that scope line ended on O. Therefore, L horseshoe to O by 5 through 8, or if you prefer, 3 through 8, conditional proof. Something's gone wrong here. Let's take a look at another example where this sort of logical maneuvering commits fallacious inferences. Now, line number 1, our premise, says Q implies R. It should be obvious that the conclusion here shouldn't follow that P implies R. But here's my fallacious proof. How about I say... P as an assumption for a conditional proof and introduce my scope line and I'll introduce an assumption for conditional proof within that original assumption. That's okay so far. Now by lines 1 and 3, modus ponens, that will get you to R. Have I shown that 2 takes you all the way to 4? Well, no I haven't. I made a, a mistake here. What happened is the conditional proof that ran from lines 3 and 4 was not discharged before the line uh, 2 through 4 was discharged. You can't uh, discharge two assumptions at once. You got to take them one at a time. So to review, anytime that you're going to do a conditional proof, introduce your assumption for conditional proof, that is introduce the assumption, then make your jump within your the scope of your assumption. Once you make your jump, you have to learn to dump. <laughs> if you remember to do all those correctly and remember our three permissions I'm sorry, two permissions, three restrictions, you're going to do really well with conditional proofs. Well, now we're, ready to, now we're ready to move on and study the indirect proof, a close cousin of the conditional proof. Now, we said earlier that proofs in the natural deduction can become needlessly long and tedious. I have to, also have to mention they become, become very uh, difficult to figure out, brain teasers. Take a look at this one. A or B implies C and D. Premise two, C implies the negation of D, therefore tilde A. Now to prove this the hard way, you might have to take the following route. One thing you could do is just point out that 2 is equivalent to 3 by implication. And if that's the case, this is one of those few times where I'm going to use De Morgan's rule to put the tilde outside a set of parentheses. Why did I do that? Because I'm setting myself up for modus tollens. I want to say that no line number 4 is the negation of the consequent in line number 1. Now when I have that, I'll use De Morgan's to unpack line 5, and that's why I'm going to wind up with my tilde A by simplification on the conjunction in 6. Well, it's pretty straightforward when I lay it out there for you like this, but it's a very uh, tough puzzle. It's a brain teaser, and you could be, uh, well, you could do this more simply. In plain speech, what you might want to look at is, what would have happened if A were true? Notice these two premises and work your way along them. If A were the case, you should be able to prove uh, D on line 1, and since you get C out of line 1 as well, you should be able to prove tilde D. Simply put, A seems to lead to contradictions. So you could say, suppose hypothetically that we had A. 
If we had A, assumption for indirect proof, then we'd get to A or B, because A can wedge off to anything. Then by line one and modus ponens, that'd get you to C and D. So you'd have both C and D in your pocket, and C on line two would get you the negation of D. Hence, you're gonna get to both D and its negation. A proves contradictions on these premises. So, if A can't be true, there's only one option. Its opposite, tilde A, must be. The basic principle behind an indirect proof is that anything that proves contradictions has to be wrong. You can't have contradictions turning out true. So if a, an assumption leads to contradictions, then that assumption must be wrong. Now this proof is going to be a little bit longer, but it's much more intuitive. If you want to uh, do this argument, you may just prove start out by assuming the opposite of your conclusion, A. Now if A is an assumption for your indirect proof, AIP, we're going to run a scope line here and along that assumption line we're going to say A or B must be the case by addition of course and by that C or D must be the case because of line one by modus ponens. Now that gives us C which I'm going to use in just a minute because I need C to get to tilde D by using line number two. Now if I have tilde D, look back at line five, I'm going to flip-flop C and D in line five by commuting them and then I'm going to wind up with D by simplification. Now, when you put 7 and 9 together, you wind up with a contradiction. Therefore, since whatever proves contradictions must be false, line 3, A, well, our assumption for indirect proof, proved a contradiction. 7 and 9 were just conjoined in line 10, and tilde A follows due to lines 3 through 10 by indirect proof. Basic idea here is, if line 3 proves contradictions, line 3 has to be rejected. So again, our basic principle here is the same as the conditional uh, assumption, or rather conditional proof. Introduce your assump, make your jump, and once you've made your jump along the scope line, then you discharge the assumption. In this case, you discharge the assumption for indirect proof. But of course, we want to put all this in technical terms. The key points are in explicitly introduce your assumption for indirect proof, keep track of how long you're using this assumption, and notice I added a new point here, point C. Some systems, not all, require you to have a line where you state explicitly that some statement of the form P and tilde P has been proven. I put that in the blue on the last slide. Be sure to discharge the assumption when you're done with it, mentioning that your result followed by indirect proof. Some systems don't require point C. Um, sometimes they just require that a formula and its negation occur on the scope line, but some systems want you to conjoin both the formula and its uh, negation. That way, everything's explicit. It's important to note that all the restrictions that we had on conditional proofs apply to indirect proofs, but the permissions are extended as well. Let's take well, pause the video for a second and familiarize yourself with these uh, premises and the conclusions. Now, when you do that, make sure you take special note of the conclusion because it is a little bit complex. Really, what, uh, you should think about that conclusion in terms of De Morgan's Law. Now, indirect proofs can be used repeatedly. My strategy is going to be this. Assume G and prove it leads to contradictions. Then assume K and prove K leads to contradictions. That's going to lead to the conclusion that 8 and 14 can be conjoined, and once I conjoin them, De Morgan's Law will give me my conclusion. So let's get started back up at line 4. Assuming G, obviously we can do modus ponens on 1, and then that's going to get us, thanks to line number 3, to tilde L. But also, L and tilde L by 3 and line 6. You can use lines to the left inside your scope line. You just can't take things outside the box or the scope line, right? So uh, tilde G follows because G led to contradictions. Now let's go down to line 9. Assuming K, then we get L dot tilde L by 1 and 2. Now given or and hypothetical syllogism, of course. And if that's the case, then L leads to tilde L. Now line 3 says that L is true, so tilde L follows by modus ponens, and we're just going to conjoin a couple lines. We're going to conjoin line 3, which we're allowed to use within the scope of this proof, uh, with uh, line number 12. And that gives us a contradiction on line 14. The rest of the uh, conclusion, or rather the conclusion, follows through the rest of this proof.
In fact, not only can you use indirect proof within the scope of uh, another indirect proof, you can use conditional and indirect proofs within the scope of one another. That's a kind of neat trick. So look at this uh, argument. We've done it before. We have, I'm introducing an assumption for conditional proof here because our conclusion is a conditional sentence. That seems helpful. And I can get a little ways uh, towards that conclusion by using line one. Now what I'm going to do is, since the uh, conclusion involves a negation, a tilde m, it looks like I should just assume, uh, if I want to get to l implies tilde m, maybe I should just assume m for indirect proof and show that contradictions follow. If so, then I'll reach tilde m eventually and my conclusion. Just like so. So all I have to do is fill out lines 5 through 11 and I'll be home free because the last two lines in the proof, numbers 12 and 13 incidentally, are going to jettison or discharge assumptions one at a time according to one of our restrictions. Now given line 5, I'm going to use line 4 to get to n and o and simplify to n. And since I have o available to me in line 6, I just have to commute and simplify. Then I can use that in line number two to get to tilde n. Now once I've done that, I've got a contradiction between lines seven and 10. Given a contradiction, I move to line 12 by indirect proof, discharging one assumption. And then I move from uh, to 13 by conditional proof, discharging a second assumption. There's plenty of tricks that you can use uh, when you're dealing with indirect and conditional proofs. One of the tricks is, Indirect proofs can help prove conclusions that aren't negations. Let's take a look at how you can do that. Now here's a, here's a proof that we did earlier in order to demonstrate how indirect proofs work. I hope you're still familiar with it. But notice, we didn't have to prove the conclusion that tilde A, we could have, if you swap A for tilde A throughout this entire proof, uniformly, uh, one for the other, you can see that we can actually prove a conclusion like A. So I just swapped the A's and tilde A's. Notice that when you get to the bottom, uh, because on line three we introduced tilde A as an assumption for conditional proof, we're going to negate that down on line 11. And then, one last move, we're just going to use double negation. So notice we proved a conclusion A using the exact same proof and exact same form of argument as before. Uh, but that just demonstrates that indirect proofs are, well, handy for all sorts of proofs, uh, proofs of negations and proofs of positive claims. Here's another little trick you should remember. Technically speaking, um, indirect proof and conditional proof are redundant. Anything you can prove with one, you should be able to prove with the other. You really just need one technique. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, anything that implies its own uh, opposite has to be false. Look at these two premises. Tilde f leads to g dot k, and k leads to f. Obviously, tilde f is going to take us to f, and that's why this conclusion involving r is going to follow. Because if f is going to be proven true by the premises, well, then a tilde f would its opposite, horseshoes to anything. I'll show you that technique if uh, you haven't learned it yet. So I'm going to assume tilde f for indirect proof and then get to g and k by modus ponens, flip-flop the g and k by commuting them, and reduce to k. Once I get k by itself, I can use line 2 to unlock f by modus ponens. Now, obviously, we have a contradiction between line and six, uh, 3 and 7, and that means our original assumption has to be false. So I double negate line 3, and with that in mind, I can reduce that to f. Remember, you can use indirect proofs to prove positive claims, which is what we really just did. With f in my pocket, I can uh, wedge off to r if I want to, and then I get by implication that tilde f implies r. It's a tricky little proof, but it's interesting that uh, you can prove in this particular context uh, positive claims using an indirect proof. We just had that essential line uh, involving double negation on 10. but we could have taken over the proof from this point onward and done it differently. Suppose instead we had said tilde f implies f as our conclusion. Uh, that is, when we discharged, we said we're going to discharge the lines 3 through 7 by conditional proof. Tilde f proved that f. We could have done that. And if that's the case, then double tilde f or f by implication, which reduces to f wedge f by double negation and therefore f by tautology. So if f is true, we can wedge off again to r, just like we did on line 11 in the previous version of the proof, and we get the same result, tilde f implies r. 
this is just one example of how uh, conditional and indirect proofs are really interchangeable. In an earlier lesson, I told you that tautology would be a useful rule, and we just used it for, to help us through technicalities previously. Now you can see how tautology was a help. It was essential in that uh, little subproof to the right that I did on the previous slide. Essentially what happens is that it reduces indirect proof to conditional proof. Uh, if anything implies its own negation conditionally, then the negation is true. So if you get f implying that tilde f, well then that means tilde f, or tilde f implies f means f. So this is a rule, tautology, that's going to help us reduce indirect proofs to conditional proofs. Well, let's move on to our next topic, proving logical truths. What are logical truths? Well, logical truths are tautologies that occur that are due to form. Tautologies are sentences that cannot possibly be false, like all bachelors are men. But that is a tautology due to semantics. A tautology due to form, like if it's raining, it's raining, uh, R implies R. That is uh, necessarily true, uh, cannot possibly be false, but that's due to its logical shape or form, not just semantics. So recall, when we were classifying statements in earlier uh, lessons, we said there's tautologies, self-contradictions, and contingent sentences. And when we were doing truth tables, we pointed out that every sentence is going to be in one and only one of these categories. Tautologies we proved by truth tables uh, because they had all truths in their columns, like in the column to the right on this table. This is a truth table that we did in an earlier lesson to try and demonstrate that a compound sentence was actually a tautologous, which means it could not possibly be false. Statements that are tautologies and propositional logic should be provable from no premises whatsoever. In other words, the tautology's truth should follow not from any particular set of premises, but just due to logic itself. No premises needed. So I should be able to prove the uh, sentence that we, compound sentence we were looking at on the last slide from no premises at all. How can I do that? Well, notice that line number six down here, the sentence we were looking at, is a horseshoe claim. I'm going to start out by assuming the antecedent, and I'm going to try to reach by line number five in this proof, the consequent, and then discharge the proof. So I'm just going to flip-flop the two uh, elements in line number one, and then I'm going to pull out uh, G horseshoes to H by simplification on one, and g by simplification on 2. 3 and 4 by modus ponens will get me to h. So I introduced an assumption for conditional proof. I did not need premises in this argument. And then I commute on 1, and I drag out uh, the first conjunct, and then secondly I drag out the first, sec first conjunct on the first line, put them together by modus ponens, and voila, I discharge the proof. I discharge the assumption 1, uh, but notice this proof did not require any premises. Not every argument does. The importance of logical truths is that they are necessity claims. They are necessary in virtue of logic alone. They are not necessary in virtue of any particular sets of premises. That's going to be important when we do modal logic later on. So keep your eyes on this. The reason is because necessity claims or necessary, necessary truths can also be treated in propositional logic as theorems. In Kenneth Conendike's book, he defines uh, a formula P as a theorem if uh, there is a proof of it which uses no premises. Provability without premises is sufficient for theoremhood, and it is sufficient for necessity claims, things that cannot possibly be false, or as we put it, propositional logic tautologies. Let's give an example. Um, or a challenge, rather. Let's prove modus ponens is a theorem, instead of taking it as one of the rules of our systems, using only the other rules of inference. In other words, let's make believe that modus ponens is not one of our rules, and we have to derive it from the other rules that we have. Now, the last proof that I did, in which we proved uh, a long sentence in line, line number six, uh, from no premises whatsoever, involved modus ponens. I guess the real challenge here is, could we have done proofs without modus ponens? Does modus ponens or something like it follow just by using other rules? Here's a rather longish and boring way of doing it. My strategy is going to be to prove line 7, the general form that P implies Q along with the antecedent P would imply Q, I can get there if I can get to line 6. What I'm basically doing is I'm exporting. Here's how the rest of the proof is going to look. Assume the antecedent of line number 6 and try to prove the consequent. Now, 
you might stop to think here a moment. Assume the antecedent of line number six and approve the consequent. They're the exact same thing. Yes, but we have to go through a few steps in this particular system that I've laid out. Actually, we're going to have to assume uh, the opposite of number one for indirect proof, conjoin the two, and get an explicit contradiction. Once we have that, we can move to the double negation of that. And by double negation elimination, P implies Q. I know this seems like a longish way of getting from line 1 to line 5. There are certain systems that have something called the reiteration rule, which allows you to repeat any line that you previously had. Since our system doesn't have it, I had to lay out this proof. The point is that by the time you get to line 6, by conditional proof, then all you have to do is export. And line number 7 is basically the rule modus ponens. Therefore, it is provable as a theorem, and notice, I proved it on my looking at my justifications to the right. I proved it without assuming it. This may lead you to ask: uh, If we didn't need modus ponens, um, could are there systems which use rules other than the ones we've studied? Yes. Uh, exactly which rules you use in a particular system of logic is really uh, it's not altogether arbitrary, but there is some leeway. A system could have treated modus ponens instead of as a rule as derivable, a theorem derivable from the rules of a system. And that's true for other rules as well. Consider something like the rule of absorption, which we have not studied. P implies Q is equivalent to the claim that P implies, well, both itself and Q. And consider the rule exportation, which we do have in our system. For Patrick Hurley's textbook, which I've used, exportation is a rule and absorption is provable from exportation and other rules. For Konendijk, absorption is a rule in his system. Exportation is not. As is there some sort of leeway here? And generally there is. So consider the rule absorption, which we do not ha have in our system. It's not in our system as an axiom or as a rule, but we could have proved it from the rules that we do have. All we have to do is use the proofs of logical pr uh, truths that we've studied earlier. How do we do that? Well, first we need to get a game plan. Always lay out exactly what it is we want to do in order to demonstrate a claim. Now, look at the. In order to de get your proof going, notice that the uh, absorption rule at the bottom of your screen is a triple bar. Uh, I'm going to give you just a few hints on how to fill out this proof and let you fill in the blanks. It's actually pretty straightforward once you get a game plan. First, you need to demonstrate that the implication goes one direction, and you need to prove the implication goes the opposite direction as well, which I'll demonstrate earlier in the proof. Now notice what you're trying to demonstrate when you discharge the two assumption lines that I have, you're trying to prove horseshoe claims. So when that happens, you assume the antecedent and try to get to the consequent. And again, assume the antecedent and try to get to the consequent in the second half of the proof. Now from here, it should seem pretty easy how to fill in the blanks, and so I'm going to leave that for you as an exercise, but this is the general form of the proof by which you could prove in our system that absorption is provable from our rules. Just make sure that when you fill out the proof you recognize you're going to need another conditional proof as well because you're trying to get from, well, the antecedent uh, listed as your assumption to the consequent. See how the proof is going to fill out? Go ahead and fill it in. So is any theorem a candidate for a rule of inference? Yes. Uh, logicians who construct their derivation systems have some leeway here, but but the general rule is don't put too many rules in your system, which is why we don't have absorption in our system as a rule. We had exportation. But give enough of the rules for the system to be easy to use. You don't want to leave out something basic like modus ponens or hypothetical syllogism. That's why all textbooks tend to have almost the exact same set of rules in them. And the result is that any useful system at least offers a rule for introducing a connective, like a horseshoe, introducing a wedge, and for eliminating it. So bare minimum, if you have five connectives in a system, you're going to have at least ten rules. All right, well that's enough theoretical stuff to get us set up for our next course in logic, but for now, you've just finished your first course. Congratulations, you should be proud. The second course is still to come, and I look forward to seeing you when I put that together. I hope these videos have been helpful and have gotten you through plenty of logic classes at your college or university where you're studying. Take care and have a nice, uh, nice time with logic.